Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everyone. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at SITE. And I'm joined by my co-host this week, uh, Louisa Tomar. She is the uh, program officer for Global. And she's also an expert, in-house expert on the digital economy. And she also works on a lot lot of women's programs. Uh, Louisa, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, And also Jacqueline. And I'm going to try to get this name right. Jacqueline uh, Amuna. Is that Muna? Musita, Musitwa, Musitwa. You know what? I had this perfect before the show started, and of course, I get on my and, and, and can't pronounce it. So, anyway, thank you so much for being here. Uh, she is an attorney, and uh, she is an ITC 4D expert, who's most recently the executive director of the financial sector of Deepening Uganda, and she's also an executive level. Uh, has various uh, executive level positions uh, in African financial institutions. Thanks so much, Jacqueline, for for coming. Thank you so much for having me. And are you just visiting here in Washington right now? or Yes, just here to see family en route for meetings at the United Nations uh, next week. And where are you based? I'm based in Kampala. In Kampala. Uganda, yes. Great. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you got to these various positions, and then we'll get into the conversation. Okay, great. Thanks. So I'm a lawyer by background, and my journey has started as a transactional lawyer in a large U.S. law firm in California. And I quickly understood that I did not want to practice law in a big <laughs> firm, um, but I was interested. You and about 90% of the people that And most that people that start school, their right? careers that way. Um, what I was interested in was the link between law and international development. And so over time, I created a law firm that basically connected the two. And a in, law in California? No, in New York. Oh, okay. In New York, and then extended the law firm to Kigali, Rwanda. And a lot of the work that we've done over the years has been, on the one hand, representing African governments in negotiations with foreign investors, also working on legislative drafting and improving the broad legal environment, and trying to make African countries more attractive to, to foreign investment. To investment, yeah. yeah. And then on the other hand, it's been representing investors that have been coming to the African continent. There's been a lot of buzz in the past 15 or 20 years. On the one hand, because of a lot of the legislative changes, but also there's been a strong commodity boom. And so we were part of that journey of bringing in investors and helping them understand what opportunities were in the African continent. My most recent role at Financial Sector Deepening Uganda was me taking a little bit of a break from the law and really applying concepts that I had used over the year within legal practice, but now using a development model to impact change in a financial market. And effectively, the work there was working with Ugandan financial regulators directly to improve the regulatory environment, uh, but also working with innovators that were coming up with really fascinating financial solutions to solving the issues um, of poverty and financial access. And so um, in that role, we managed to come up with some really cool initiatives around access to finance for refugees, access to finance for women, but also um, helping regulators come up with innovative solutions to regulating like the regulatory sandbox. Great. So let's get back to uh, to what you mentioned a while ago. You you worked a lot with governments to help improve the ecosystem for investors uh, so international investors could come in. What are some of the key points? What are some of the key things that you work with the governments on to, to, to make that happen? So there are several things. Uh, One was the recognition that a lot of legal frameworks in African countries were just old. They were adopted post-independence, which would have been anywhere from the 1950s to the 1970s, and they hadn't really changed much over the years. So effectively, they were not fit for purpose. And now, talking about the fourth industrial revolution and the fact that the world has changed so much, a lot of governments realized it was time to update not only their commercial codes, but also start thinking about 
data privacy and what that means for them. Uh, thinking about cybersecurity, for instance, and how to best protect themselves as a government, but also companies operating within their borders. And so the work that I've done with governments has really been helping them think through what the future looks like and how changing their legal systems can get them there. The other work I've done with governments has been around contract negotiation. Um, a lot of what we hear in the media is, you know, government X in Africa has sold off X um, hectares of land to foreign investors or, you know, government's got a raw deal. And a lot of governments um, recognize the fact that, one, they didn't have the capacity. Two, sometimes there is corruption in dealings with contracts. Um, three, they're just on an uneven surface. So over time, they're after they did kind of recognize that, it was how do we get in lawyers that do have experience in international negotiation and that do have experience from countries where the money is coming from, like the U.S., to really help them understand how to negotiate better contracts and subsequently help also improve the capacity of their own domestic government lawyers to do their work themselves eventually. So that's what's kept me busy for the past, yeah, 15 years or so. Well, you mentioned something well ago, and I think it's a perfect segue into what we really want to get into today, which is the digital economy. And I, and I know you're very interested in that, and you really want to talk about that. But we're talking about foreign investment and how things have really evolved with that. How important is the digital economy, and especially uh, uh, financial technology now? I think it's very important, um, but we do need to recognize that Africa is on the one hand taking two steps forward and on the other hand two steps back. I say that because as far as the digital economy, there is an attempt by government, as I mentioned before, to change the legal infrastructure, that's fine, but there is a lot of money coming in from foreign investors to really find the next um, creative solution to solving global problems. So we look at Give me this, a couple of examples. the story of M-Pesa, right? Okay. Digital money. How do we actually use our mobile phones to pay for anything as small as a coffee, but also, you know, to pay rent and also to um, engage in person to government payments? How do I pay my taxes? I can use my mobile phone to pay taxes. And so that has changed how, one, people view technology in Africa, but practically it's changed how Africans interact and understand money. No longer is it people carrying wads of cash. Right. Now it's just making sure I have my and phone on me. more importantly, informal versus formal parts of the economy. Exactly. They're, they're a part of the economy because it's so easy now compared to what it was in, in the past. And it's also transparent. True. Digital footprint doesn't go away. True. It's always there. True. And from a government perspective, this is now a way, one, to understand how much money really win -win. is in the system, yeah. and two, to tax it. Now, it, there's been a lot of controversy absolutely. around the tax, but the reality is this is the best way we've seen in the continent so far to really understand the informal economy. The other part of the digital economy is that the issues that have plagued Africa still exist. There is mass poverty, and right now there is definitely a growing digital divide between people that have access to the technology and people that don't. That's a really good question, and in, in, in how, how can that be solved? Because I know we've had other guests come on, and I think, uh, Louise, we've talked about this before, yeah. is how to, how to bridge that gap, you know, how to make that happen. Uh, because I know it's much more expensive than, than it is in a lot of places. And in, in, in some cases, it, it's almost done on purpose in a way to, to kind of keep people marginalized in, 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 in out of the system as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? So in the 1990s, um, there was basically a wave within, a positive wave within the telecommunications sector. And all of a sudden, it went from access to phones being really, really expensive. Right to it becoming cheaper and cheaper. And to today, it still is becoming cheaper and cheaper, not only from the telco side, but also from the actual mobile phones. And so now you can find some pretty cheap um, smartphones on the market. And that's the way most people will eventually end up accessing technology. So you do have the situation where people are slowly able to save 
and buy mobile devices. How, so how that's much, a positive. How much does a phone normally cost uh, in your country? So you can get a fairly simple smartphone for the equivalent of about 50 to $70. Okay, and that's uh, like an Android phone or a Google and that's, phone? Yeah, and that's yeah. an Android phone. Yeah, like a second or third generation. Yes, but, but and the, the prices are going down. Yeah. And there are a lot of phone companies like MiFi, for instance, that mm -hmm. are creating African phones. So mm -hmm. they are produced in Mauritius. Um, and, and use they, a local G, uh, GCM um, chip? And they... And, they you, all phones use local chips, of or GSM, course, or GSM. Yeah. But then also, it's how do we make them even cheaper so more people have access right. to it? So a lot of phone producers, including the majors like Huawei, are constantly tinkering with their models to just try and make it cheaper so more people can access it. So I do think mobile phone access will be the key to reducing the digital divide. A lot of app creators are also coming up with really cool and interesting apps that also help further reduce the divide, whether it's in education or access to healthcare right. um, or financial technology. So I am really hopeful about the proliferation of mobile phones. Having said that, I think we need to not only consume, I think that there needs to be more creativity and productivity. So here in the US, Amazon is kind of one of the largest, if not like the largest company right. in the country. We're not seeing that trend yet across the continent. People are not yet buying online as much. Part of it is the practicality. A lot of places do not have trackable physical addresses. So even right. if you ordered something, right. there's nowhere well, to Well, delivery take it. systems too is probably exactly. very expensive. It is. Yeah. Now, there are different um, solutions to that. We've seen in Rwanda, in the case of medical care, where they're using drones. And drones are using kind of location devices to drop medicine in different areas. So people are starting to think through some of these problems. Having said that, I think it'll take time for us to get to mass scale yeah. where people are able to kind of order something on um, one of the online platforms today and get it by the next day. So one of the things you're mentioning is sort of the technology that is has the potential to to change how people interact with government, with one another, and business-to-business -business transactions. But I'm curious your thoughts more on the ecosystem-wide policy um, in addition to the technology because that's where sort of the digital divide gets exacerbated even when um, the cost of let's say a mobile phone continues to go down. So I'm curious how your work with governments has sort of looked to address some of those, those issues. From an ecosystem perspective, broadly, a lot of governments do realize this is the way of the future. They may not know how to get there, but they are at least cognizant of that. So I'll look at the case of Comesa, which is a common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, which covers Eastern and Southern African countries. As a regional grouping, there is there has been the decision that the digital economy is important. Mm -hmm. And so governments there decided as a group to forge a way forward. That means that smaller countries like Lesotho or Swaziland that might not have the internal capacity to think about what to do with technology are able to jump on the regional bandwagon and have the region help propel them forward. So I do think that there are some interesting solutions coming out of regional economic groupings. I mentioned Comesa, but also at the East African community level, mm -hmm. those conversations are taking place as well as the West African ECOWAS level. So I think regional economic groupings, I think, is a first important step. Nationally, I think that there are increasingly more African examples to follow. I think a challenge we've had with legal systems in the past is we look at the U.S. and get overwhelmed because it's way too advanced. You look at Asia, it's equally advanced. And now you look at a country like Kenya, and Kenya is really forging the way for other countries to say there is an African country. So they're kind of the leader in Africa? In many ways yeah. in the technology space, yeah. Kenya, yeah. South Africa 
are quite uh, far advanced. You know, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because we talk about this all the time in here, that there's such a lag between government uh, understanding of technology and the, and the private sector. And it's just natural. They're going to lag behind. So, and and so, so Kenyan, in your opinion, is probably farther ahead than the other, other governments. You can even look at our government here in the United States. They're way behind in, in terms of their understanding of the technology. But that, that's always been like that. I think there's an unfortunate situation of kind of cat chase mouse when it, it comes is. to regulators and innovators. Yeah. I think it's very healthy for innovators to run yeah. and come up with solutions. But I equally think it's healthy for innovators to engage regulators. They have to. And that doesn't happen as much. No. Um, and when I think of, I previously sat on the board of Bank of Zambia, which is the financial regulator of Zambia. And what we saw was a lot of innovators come up with solutions. And rather than engaging the regulator at the beginning as they're thinking of it, they kind of wait. And they wait to get to the point where it's I have this late. product and now I need permission. Yeah. And by the time they're asking for permission, the amount of time it takes to get the regulator up to speed, yeah. to get the regulator comfortable, and to get the regulator to decide, are we going to say no? Are we going to say yes? Are we going to pause? It's just a whole lot of time. It is. Which is why I think that there's an interesting concept within the legal world going on right now of regulatory sandboxes. How do you as a regulator, especially a financial services regulator, understand that there is a lot that you don't know, but you're able to put aside a framework that really allows innovators within a specific country to stretch the limits of your legal system and test in a safe space where consumers are protected, you're fully aware of every stage of the way. The UK has done that successfully. Singapore has done that successfully. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing examples of that happening in South Africa, yep. in Kenya, in we, Sierra Leone as well. We see it in some places of all places, Belarus in, in Eastern Europe. You would never think of Belarus as being one of the leaders in, in, in the digital economy, but they are in the region, which is amazing. No, it's Eastern Europe is also providing us with really interesting examples on one digital identity mm -hmm. and how people interact with government through the digital space. So I think of Lithuania, right. um, I think of Estonia, and a lot of African governments are paying attention to those examples and taking notes because until very recently, a lot of countries um, had IDs, but not everyone in the country had an ID. In the U.S., everyone is born and gets access to a social security number. Mm -hmm. So from day one, you are tagged. In a lot of African countries, people are born, they don't have birth certificates, and then when they turn of mature age, they don't have IDs as well. So they're just kind of lost in yeah. their system. And now with the recognition that IDs are important, not only for people's, um, for the government to know who's in their country, mm -hmm. but also to be able to provide goods and services, right. and then eventually allow people to better interact with government, Governments well, are it bridges that gap Absolutely. Be between especially uh, people in poverty mm -hmm. and with the government because True. there is that connection there that, that, that wasn't existed. It didn't exist before. True. But let's get back to in, in what you're talking about is really advocacy with the government in, in educating regulators. And I know we've worked on – you especially, Louisa, with the digital guidebook. Right. And, and, and what we talk about a lot is advocacy, especially in this field. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how important that is. No, absolutely. I mean, I think Jacqueline talks about the difficulty of, you know, getting governments up to speed to determine how best to regulate or not regulate to get out of the way a bit and have a give and take with the innovators. Um, but SIPE, of course, works with a broad coalition of local business communities. And many of, many of these businesses, you know, as they move online, they don't necessarily consider themselves digital businesses, data companies, but they are increasingly becoming digitized. Um, and these policies that affect the most innovative tech companies may also affect, you know, sort of these small and medium-sized enterprises just trying to sell goods, maybe to one country over. Um, and so trying to build new coalitions of local business communities um, to agree on different 
policy and legal frameworks for, again, an ecosystem-wide approach. Um, I'm curious if you have any advice for local business communities of what they might prioritize. I know um, your experience at New America as a cybersecurity fellow, sort of what are the policies that you think could help facilitate um, stronger uh, security for small businesses and at the same time not sort of damper the, the opportunities for innovation? I think one area, at least within the African continent, and a conversation that is going right now, that's going strong, that still requires a lot of private sector input, mm -hmm. and that um, especially requires the voice of SMEs, are the conversations around the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. That's being led by the African Union. And at the local level, there is opportunities uh, for small businesses to engage with the Chamber of Commerce, but also to engage more broadly with the AU. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, I think, is really engaging with Chambers of Commerce. A lot of times the Chambers have large companies, but I do think it's a good opportunity for small companies as well. Also on the AU side, they have been very proactive about um, engaging more broadly. So whilst before it was you had to go to Addis Ababa, now you have social media. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to for a small business in Madagascar or a small business in Mali to just get online and say, these are some of the issues we are facing. Mm -hmm. How do we better channel our concerns to you? Um, I think another area is really for... Um, one, government engagement directly and letting governments understand more of the challenges that small businesses um, are facing. Um, a lot of governments have either a directorate of small business affairs, um, and I think it's important to engage those. A lot of times the SMEs that I meet get frustrated because, you know, government is so big, I don't know where to go. Right. And I do think that there is an opportunity to, one, find whatever... Um, yeah, small business authority is there to engage them. It may not result in success immediately, and I think that that's something that I need to caution against. Any time that we are dealing with large bureaucracies, it right. takes time. Yeah, And so SMEs need to understand that it does take time, but eventually um, the beauty of social media is that those conversations are taking place and governments are more aware of their the public's needs and they are paying attention because no government wants to be shamed online. Right. I wanted to ask, um, you talk about Comesa and some other regional trade blocks. I'm curious, are those different groupings quite aligned with the AU's overall free trade agreement? I mean, do you see sort of East Africa moving in the same direction as other parts of the continent? Or do you think it's going to be kind of a, a tricky matter to bring that all together Um for the free trade agreement, but with maybe with like a digital trade lens to that question. Um, I think no matter what, it's tricky. Anytime you have more than two parties together, <laughs> it does become tricky. And now when you have 53 um, subdivided into groups, I think it's going to be tricky. What I will say is that the leadership of the African Union um, under Kagame definitely pushed the conversation forward. And a lot of what we saw in recent years has been the push for making it easier for people to move across countries. Mm -hmm. Free movement of people has been a huge issue. And now moving forward, um, the question is, okay, we've had the conversation about people. We're trying to make that easier. We've had the conversation about goods. Now the conversation about services is happening. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of having the conversation about services now is it's also at a time when the WTO is talking about digital trade as well. Right. And so a lot of the members of the WTO, which is most of the continent, are having the parallel conversation at Geneva level, but also at Addis Ababa level. And so I do think that in the next year to three, you will see kind of a convergence of ideas on that. And it will be a bit more clear for African countries on the way forward. Right now, like the rest of the world there is still a lot of understanding that needs to take place. Sure. Um, and also the problem with technology is things are changing so fast. Yes. So whether you're talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, so much is happening at such a fast pace. 
Um, and my hope is that by keeping themselves informed, they will be able to not necessarily regulate at first, but come up with a framework that helps them understand how best to manage mm -hmm. the businesses they're in. Because what we don't want is a situation where they regulate too soon and it stifles innovation. Right. Absolutely. What we do want to see is a situation where they understand the parameters and companies are able to still innovate without hurting consumers. Great. I wanted to, sorry, I'd be remiss if I didn't wish you a happy International Women's Day. Um, and I also wanted to ask if you could speak a bit um, with a gender lens on some of these sort of digital economy issues, uh, specifically in East Africa and what you're seeing um, related maybe to women-owned business and women digital entrepreneurs. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and happy International Women's Day to you as well. And happy International Women's Month. I think the challenge um, women in technology face in East Africa is similar to the rest of the world. There are just not enough women. And the women that are in the space are not raising enough money mm -hmm. or raising as much money as men. Um, what we are seeing now is a lot more uh, groupings of women to support one another. Mm -hmm. um, Kenya is definitely leading the way. But in Uganda as well, um, we are seeing groups supported by innovation hubs mm -hmm. where there are saying, OK, women, we do see we do understand what the challenges are. We are providing platforms. I do think that there is um, a lot of room uh, for women to engage with um, global networks. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as much. Um, but I also do think that it's an amazing time for African women innovators because they're not that many. So for women that are coming up with interesting solutions, I do think it's a good time to get attention. Wonderful. You know, Jacqueline, we were talking earlier about how technology has brought people in from the informal to the formal and also how they become connected with, with the government. But we haven't really talked about how, and we were just talking about women, uh, but I want to talk about entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, and how technology really helps them, especially small entrepreneurs who really cannot uh, compete with some of the, the larger, more traditional uh, parts of the economy. How has that really been a game changer, especially for small entrepreneurs in, in the area of trade, not, not only international trade, but, but trade within a country? We're definitely seeing a lot of um, small women-owned businesses on platforms such as Facebook, right? I sell baskets, I sell honey, I sell whatever product, and they're able to set up Facebook accounts, mm -hmm. Instagram accounts, and the like. And I think what that has done is it's brought about a lot of visibility to their businesses, but it's also allowed them to engage with audiences locally as well as internationally. And at the local level, and twenty years ago, that wouldn't and happen. that would have right. never happened. Never Actually, happened. even over five years ago, it right. wouldn't have yeah. happened. And so now, what you are seeing is you are able to order stuff online, pay online, um, and in the case of Uganda, have a boda boda, which is a motorcycle, deliver you your goods. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, whether you're ordering lunch, uh, which tends to be my case, it's I can go online, order my lunch. And a motorcycle delivers my lunch. And those jobs weren't there just no. a few years ago. And it's the jobs wasn't there. Either the woman had, you know, a kiosk where mm -hmm. she was selling food, but you had to go to the kiosk. Yeah. So if you didn't have the time, yeah, you would never. Well, and, and they would lose out yeah. on the on the transaction. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. so now she's able to sell her food online. The Boda man is able to also earn a fee by mm -hmm. driving the food to you. And so I think things are changing. Yeah. I think what we do need to see more of is larger scale businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at the but lowest I think that'll SME, evolve though. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. Because at the lowest of levels, I think that the opportunity is there. I think another medium that has been incredible has really been what's up. Mm -hmm. People are able to send out mass messages it of is what so they're so amazing you mentioned that because in every developing country that, that we work in, that is probably the most popular form of communication. It's amazing. True. What's interesting for me, though, is I see WeChat as a platform. Really? And you're able yeah. to do pretty Everything. much anything yeah. Yeah. on WeChat. Yeah. 
I'm actually surprised that Facebook hasn't taken advantage of that really, and learned yeah. from it because the opportunity for payments right. is great. Yeah. Uh, not as many Africans are using WeChat, but Africans yeah. are using uh, WhatsApp. So I do think that well, there's an opportunity. it's such a visual medium too. too. So. There's but an I, opportunity in the payment space mm -hmm. uh, to really maximize the potential of the platform. I, I feel like, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about limiting how far a WhatsApp message can go and also yeah. keeping that sort of closed and encrypted but that's not to say another app oh yeah shouldn't we'll, we'll potentially fill that, it will. that exact spot <laughs> yeah um, it, exactly yeah. true and i mean obviously the issue of data privacy is one that is evolving across the continent yeah. not all countries are there yet uh, and that one. gets back to what we were talking about earlier about regulators and government being behind the curve and True, but you know. in this case also, there's an issue of surveillance, right? Yes, How much right. is the state really monitoring people and, and for what purposes? And, uh, and companies, right? too, that have the means, they're, they're going to do the same thing. Exactly. So yeah. I think that there's an interesting interplay here of national security interests versus people just wanting to earn a living, right. exactly. wanting to entertain themselves, wanting to communicate with their loved ones. Yeah. And all of these things are at play. And... Obviously, African governments, like governments elsewhere, are looking at examples of what's happening around the world. And there are some scary examples. Well, WhatsApp's yeah. probably out of most of the platforms is the most secure, I think, from, from what I understand. Um, or, Telegram or, or is that, is that seems changing? to be. Is it? <laughs> yeah. I, I hear Telegram is much more secure. Is it? But yeah. yeah. See, everything I mean, changes. WhatsApp's encrypted, but. It's um, encrypted, yeah. I don't know that people particularly trust. Measure, countermeasure, right? <laughs> True. Exactly. True. Jacqueline, we're almost at the end of the program. We have about three or four minutes. And I always have a segment that I end the program with. It's called Five Years From Now. So if you were to come back and do this program five years from now, what will we be talking about? Five years from now, I think we will be talking about the next cool and innovative financial product out of the continent. I think we've talked about M-Pesa a lot mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. past um, decade or so. And I think five years from now, there will be cool and interesting solutions. Um, Andela has been raising a lot of money and really coming up with solutions to the capacity divide and increasing the number of programmers across the continent. But I think the next stage of solutions coming out of the continent will really be solving more emerging market problems and some of the kind of issues there. I th also think five years from now, we'll have a different conversation around gender. Mm -hmm. um, what we are noticing in a lot of the continent is there are more women that are being appointed to boards. Mm -hmm. There are a lot more women being appointed to executive positions. And so I think the dynamics of how we view the corporate world will change. I think the last thing is a lot more governments on the continent are also paying attention to the number of women in government. Uh, most recently we saw um, you know, 50% of um, the cabinet in Ethiopia being appointed. Um, Rwanda has been leading the way on gender in government as well. And a lot of African governments are realizing the benefits of including women within the government structure and the result that that's having on their policies, but also, once again, encouraging young women mm -hmm. to achieve even higher. So I think the conversation we'll have in five years will be more positive on the gender front as well. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And we're out of time. But as always, I, I, I this is one of my favorite things to do here at, at, at site because I learned so much and you did not disappoint. This has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the conversation. Louisa, thank you so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. If you have anything you want to add as a Oh, I'd just like to thank Jacqueline for sharing uh, Women's Day with us today, and thank you for the conversation. It's been a lot of yeah. fun. So see everybody next week. Take thank care. You. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at sipe.org. That's C I P E.org. Thanks for listening.